God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. I think it was two days ago I was with my wife somewhere, I'm not too sure where now. And uh, I made a statement. I said, uh, it shocks me that 6,000 years of man's history that only a small percentage of men know God. After 6,000 years, God is still a stranger in his own planet. I thought deep designer, the producer, the owner is not known. It's easy for us to judge the Jews and say, you know, just like scripture says, you know, he came to his own and his own received him not. We forget that it wasn't just Israel that he came to. He came to the world. And the Bible says in John 1 that the world was made by him. And without him was not anything made that was made. And the world rejected him. The rejection was not just Jewish. He was a combination of both Jews and Gentiles. Jesus said, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit will come. He says, and he's here with you. But the world doesn't know him. But you do. And when he said that, he wasn't saying Israel didn't know him. He said the world. He also spoke about the world not receiving. And, um, you know that as the days pass and the years too, there is a, a more, the development of a more organized rejection of God. And the rejection of God is being institutionalized. And nations are formulating policies to enshrine the rejection of God. So if the world rejects God, what about those who claim to belong to him? Even in, we, we are called the church. But even in the church, God is a stranger. God is not known. A good number of us, you know, well, as a people, we talk about God. We know about him. But we don't know him. So, we may sing songs about God. We may, hey, we have facts about him. Um, just like you know happens to many of us. You know. a, friend, a friend of mine, he's here. Um, this was in 1993. He's a medical doctor. He first read microbiology and then went back to school and read medicine. Graduated and worked of years and then decided he was going to go to Germany. He went to Germany within the first few weeks of his arrival. He got a job. He went to the hospital. Um, he saw equipment that he had never seen in his life but had, except in textbooks. He had studied there. He 
knows everything about the equipment, but when he saw the equipment, it was a completely different ball game. That, that's the kind of relationship that we have, a number of us in the church have with God. We know about him, but we don't know him. There are loads of people within the church still today don't hear God. I'm not talking about make-belief uh, words, which is gradually becoming common because everybody wants to be seen as a prophet of some sort. So God said to me, when it's your mind speaking to you, you know, and some silly stuff. You know, I remember there was a sister in church who had a grudge against me for like two years and eventually confessed her grudge. She came to me, it was many years ago, um, and she said, Pastor, um, this is what we should do. No, I said, I think this is what we should do now, or what we ought to do now in the church, in the service. So I looked at her and I listened when she was done. She said, um, as a matter of fact, that's what God spoke to me. I said, mm -hmm, hold on. You think this is what we should do? Or God spoke to you that we should do this. She was thrown into confusion because, you see, it was just hot air. So sometimes we say, oh, God said, probably by way of intimidation, you know, so that the other person will have no option but to obey. You know, you know. and... Uh, there are, times, there are times God has spoken to me clearly about certain issues and I say, I think this is what I want us to do. You know, and I try to convince people we should go in that direction because, you see, the times God speaks to you and God does not tell you to say, I'm the one who told you this. Hmm? But many of us don't have that kind of relationship. We're quick, you know, at wanting to be known as spiritual men and women. True spirituality is very different from any kind of religiosity. So do we know him? Or do we know about him? It's easy for people to say, I know God. You know, um, I don't know where I shared this now. I, I'm not sure I mentioned it yesterday. I, too confused now. We read the scripture. And um, the Bible says that Paul speaking, I'm sure it was back home. Um, he said that I may win Christ. That I may win Christ. So that I may win Christ, he said, all that I reckoned as gain before I met Jesus, I now reckon as loss. As a matter of fact, I count it as dunk. In comparison to the surpassing worth of knowing him, and then he, he went on to say quite a lot of things, you know, um, this one thing I do, forgetting the past, whether it is good or bad, it, success or failure, you know, I don't dwell on the past. You know, many of us live in the past, you know, and your future is defined by your past. Now, that means that you're not making any progress at all. You know, but it's very easy for people, oh, you know, Especially among, with husbands and wives, it's, it's easy. I, you did this, so, so so your past defines how you relate in the future. It's very common. I know you guys are wonderful and holy people. It doesn't happen to you, but it happens to me. Eh? <laughs> but 
Paul says, this one thing I do, forgetting. Huh? I press on to what lies ahead. And what is it that lies ahead? It says it's pressing toward the mark of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. And he said a whole number of things. But you see, if you read the context and you read the goal, he says the essence of all of this is that I may win him. So two things come, come out of this to me whenever I read it. That I may win him. So that's one thing. That I may win him. So I asked myself the question, shouldn't that be my goal as a believer? To win Christ. And I asked the church a question. At what point do you win Christ? And some said, oh, when you get born again. May I ask, at what point do you win Christ? Eventually, yes. When you make it. <laughs> okay. Yes. You're right. So, it was a little confusion. You know, I said, oh, but when I got born again, I said, no, no. You see, at new birth, he won you. So, he won you that you may win him. So, look at this. Do we, do we talk about soul winning? Yeah. Who are we winning souls for? For Christ. So after you are won, then you are asked to win Christ. So is it possible for a man to be won by Christ and that man lose Christ? Yes. It's very possible. So you see, the entire context in which we speak God's word, you know, like, like I said, there's been a lot of bastardization of uh, scriptures, you know, in people seem not to have clear thinking anymore about God, the church, new creation reality, the role of the Holy Spirit, and the purpose of worship. You know, some people probably feel the church is like a social ga gathering. Yeah, there's a, an aspect of it that has to do with that. Hmm? But that's, that's not the goal or the aim or the purpose of God. That I may win him, he said. That I may win him. That I may win him. I have to know him to win him. I cannot win whom I do not know. So the pursuit of the knowledge of God goes way beyond studying the scriptures and accumulating facts about it has everything to do with deep personal interaction with people. Um, we read a passage of the Bible where Paul was speaking to the church. And he said, yeah, I'm saying these things. I know I have told you before, but it is safe that I repeat what I have told you before. You know, uh, Peter said, uh, I say this thing by way of remembrance to stir up. Hmm? All right? So it is necessary. Repetition is good. Because sometimes you hear something the first time. When you hear it again, you realize you really didn't hear well. Hmm? And I learned long ago, several decades ago, that look, you have not heard until you have understood. So you may hear the word and remember the word that you remember the word does not mean you have understood the word. Uh -huh. So I heard, I remember. Doesn't mean that that word has any power 
to produce any change in my life. The power to produce change comes only when understanding is born. It is the birthing of understanding that leads to transformation. That's why the Bible says in Proverbs 16, 22, understanding is a wellspring of life to them that have it. Thank you. Understanding is a wellspring of life to them that have it. The Bible says the entrance of the word does what? Gives light and supplies understanding. And you know, when, when, where there is understanding fully is, is, is done away with, right? That the difference between the wise and the foolish is understanding. A fool has knowledge. Right? Mm -hmm. But the fool rejects understanding. And because he rejects understanding, he cannot... He, he lacks wisdom. I don't know if you're following this. So the bridge between knowledge and wisdom is what? It's understanding. You cannot, you cannot jump from knowledge to wisdom. There has to first be an understanding. And you know, that, that's where largely the church has failed. Largely. Because in our own individual lives, we do not even give ourselves to that pursuit of understanding. Memory verse, memory verse, commit to memory. It's beyond that. If you read through the, the parable of the sower, especially from the Matthew rendition of it, you would discover that the Bible says that the, the first category, they heard the word. They all heard the word, the four categories, right? This first category heard the word. Matthew says they, they did not understand it. There was no understanding. And because of a lack of understanding, it was easy for the fowls of the air to come and pick out that which was... Yeah. So, where there is no understanding, the people become easy prey to the enemy. Because there is no understanding. So I, I learned from that that understanding keeps the devil away. Hmm? Uh -huh. So when there is understanding, it is not that easy for the devil to steal. He still uses other means, but it's not that easy for him to just come and take. But where there is no understanding... He just walks in and takes. And as a matter of fact, we get to believe the, or feel that they are, yeah, he has the right to. Like many people think that the devil is very powerful. He may be, but not where I am. Hmm? And it's a simple reason for that. And it's not because of me. It's because of whose I am, where I am. Hmm? Where am I? I'm in Christ. Whose am I? I'm Christ. And so whenever he makes an approach towards me and he knows I know who I am, yeah, he can very well say, like he said to the seven sons of Sceva, Jesus I know, Paul I know. I know these ones because they are related. They belong to the same phyla. No, in Botany, that's what we're talking. Belong to the same phyla. Hmm? But you, where are you from?
You have no part in the commonwealth of Israel. You have no covenant with the living God. And you attempt to, to do what? Cast me out. All right. And he cast them out naked. <laughs> Praise God. So I, I can very well say there is power in knowledge, in, in understanding. There is power in understanding. Do you know God? You know, it's good to ask yourself that question many times, you know, as many times as possible. Many, many times as possible. When you're about to worship, when you're, when you're about to pray, when you're very happy and all is going well, you're lying on your bed or doing something, Ask yourself the question. When you are sad, ask yourself the same question. Do I know God? Because I know that those who know God don't react the same way as those who don't know God. There's always a difference. Hmm? Isn't it true? There's always a difference. Same circumstance. The old Chinese saying, the same sun that melts the wax, hardens the clay. Same sun, same heat, same temperature. One is hardened and the other melts. And so melting or hardening, it's not the sun that determines it. Is what they're made of. Is the content of a man that determines his reaction in the face of any circumstance. Right? Good or bad. Are you following what I'm trying to help you see? The same. You know, if, if we're all in the same class, class right now and, and I'm the lecturer and then I'm passing out text scripts, um, Juliet, 97. Um, Faith, 55. Do you know that the excitement in Faith might be far more than the one in Juliet? That one got 97 and she's feeling bad. Why did I miss three marks? And the one that got 55 is so excited. I passed. Wow. <laughs> Isn't it true? Yeah. And then he calls another person. What's the person's name? Tony. Yeah. <laughs> okay. That's you, Tony. Yeah? 23. <laughs> And then Tony starts feeling bad. And then John, 22. Ah, Tony is happy. I'm not alone. <laughs> ah, I'm not alone. <laughs> Praise God. So it's, it's, the, it's the content of a man's heart that actually determines, you know, okay, let, let me put this this way. The Bible says that a man's spirit sustains him in illness or infirmity. So, the content of your spirit determines the outcome of a man's life when the man is ill. You know, when, when I was about um, 10, 11 years old, I was admitted at UBTH. Just took me for a general checkup because I was always falling ill. So, I checked my genotype. They said, oh, the AA. But I am AA. Oh, and the doctor there, I remember his name very well, one guy, young guy, um, Archibong, Dr. Archibong. He said to my mom, oh, leave him in the hospital, let him stay with me. And I was in ward A1, which was supposed to be for men. But the 
put me in the men's ward. You know, and say he just wants to observe. So he wants me under his watch. They gave me a bed. Tiny boy in the midst of diseased men. And I kept playing around. I was there for a few days. I said that they gave me um, cards. Um, what do you call those cards again? Cardboard. Cardboard. Cardboard paper. All right. And so I designed and drew angels because it was close to Christmas time. You know, and I kept hanging everywhere in the world. Ah, oh, they said, oh, we have an artist here. He's, you know. And um, one night, there was a guy who was like two beds away from me. And he had this protrusion. I don't know what, what it was, but he looked very pregnant. You know, His tummy was distended heavily. And the man kept shouting, nurse, nurse. You know, some, some, some sick people can run nurses. I read. Hmm? Really. And he kept shouting throughout the night. About 3, 4 a.m., then he kept shouting, I want to die. I say, I want to die. I cannot continue like this. I slept off and woke up again. See, about an hour, an hour and a half after, and I didn't hear anything. Also, I felt, oh, finally, this man has slept. So the nurse who came around and was changing beddings and doing things, you know, came to my bedside and I asked, oh, what about that man? Because they were all my friends. So he said, oh, that man, he's there, he's on this bed. I said, oh, he's sleeping. So she said, look closely. So I looked. I discovered they had covered him over with his sheet. So I said, wow, is he dead? He said, yes. I said, huh? he wanted to die. So the nurse said, shh, shh, shh. And I learned a lesson. Never say you want to die when you don't want to die. <laughs> Never say it. I had a cousin who kept saying that over and over and over and over and over again. I sat down, I gave her counsel, and she didn't listen. She died. Eventually, it took her like two years to die. She was a wonderful, wonderful person. The power of life and death is where? So, again, a lack of understanding of the power that is resident inside you is dangerous. Hmm? You know, it is easier for you to release faith saying negative things than to release faith saying positive things. And faith always works. I believe, therefore, have I spoken. The Bible says this is the spirit of faith. So some of us, our faith is more in tune with that other aspect of us that is negative. And so we just keep saying those things, saying those things, you know. I don't believe in speaking positively, you know, when you say just be positive about life. No, just be, be truthful. Be truthful. Mm? When you speak truth, then the divine energy of God is released. It's not just when you are positive. Mm? Uh, no God. Let me not get into that. Praise God. Philippians chapter 3. Two verses I like us to read seven and eight. We already, we already talked about it. I just want you to see it. Hmm? Please read. Yes, every advantage that I have gained, I considered loss for Christ's sake. Every advantage I had gained. This was before he met Christ now, right? He considered loss, uh huh? 
for Christ's sake, yes. Yes, and I look upon everything as lost compared with the overwhelming gain of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Compared with the overwhelming gain of what? Not of knowing about, but of knowing him. Of coming into this special relationship with God. You know, when, whenever I consider this, I, I often ask myself the question, do I see knowing Christ as gain? Do I see it as gain? Do I understand do I understand the benefit of knowing Jesus? Because look at this. Everything else in this life will pass away, including marriage. Marriage is until death the world's part. Right? Will pass away. Even the position of uh, prime minister or president is timed. Isn't it true? It will pass away. Even if you become the best medical doctor on planet earth, there will come a time that right? Even the wealthiest you know, when Steve Jobs died. I think I mentioned it the last time, but there were several thoughts that crossed my mind. Here is a man who invented, invented things that were such immense benefit to mankind. If he didn't know Christ before he died, you and I know where he is. Which means that his entire life was just a waste. Just a waste. In another hundred years, if Jesus tarries, he will just be remembered in history books. As one of those who contributed. But you see, at the time Jesus eventually comes, even the records will be wiped away. Hmm? I, I don't like roads in the UK, except in a few places, maybe the newer ones. I hate to drive here. Because the roads are just too tiny. <laughs> but he's struggling to. Sometimes you have to wait for another person to, you know. <laughs> why, why is it so? It's an old civilization. In many of the new economies that are emerging, you don't have that problem. Like if you go to some of the emerging economies in Asia, hey, mega roads patterned after the American, what's it called, right? They're doing so well. So you, you walk around London sometimes or you drive, and you just see relics of ancient civilization. It's past glory. I don't know if you understand what I'm talking about. Yeah. So that which once was the pride of mankind. 
is now ancient. As a matter of fact, if it were possible to, but for the amount of money that one would spend demolishing houses to expand roads, with the few they've done, they, they know how much they spent, right? Uh -huh. In Africa, it's easier to do that. Just crush houses and expand the roads. Hmm? It's easier. You spend money, but yeah, it's good. We're happy. Hmm? It's easier. Now look at this. A man's life is much like that. And you journey, and things are relevant right now, and then after a while, those things are no longer relevant. And after a while, even you are no longer relevant. You know, the way you talk to your children now, there will come a time that you will be on the receiving end. Oh, mommy. Ah. Mommy, please think straight. Huh? <laughs> Old school. Oh, yeah. I thought so of my dad. My kids tell me the same thing today that I'm old school. I look at them as a me old school. You don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> this me, old school. I said, look, what you are talking about now is foolishness. You just don't know. That's why. You think you know, but you don't know. You know? <laughs> ah, then, daddy. Yeah. One time, any gadget that comes into the house, I was the first to, you know, understand its use and anything. Right now, kids, you don't have to say anything. They don't even have to read the manual. Just like that. Hey, Dad, do you know this, could do, this can do this? Pam, 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 and you're looking. Oh, wow. How did you learn that? Hey, it's in here. Yeah, I know it's there, but how did you... <laughs> Now I have to read manuals to know, okay, A, B, C, before you have this other one. Things are changing. Right? So it, I'm almost like becoming irrelevant in the house because if a new gadget comes into the house, nobody has to wait for daddy to come fix it. You know, I just come in and find it working. And if I were to drop dead, suddenly, their life continues. Are you following this? Then I'll face reality. Did I win Christ in my earth walk? Or did I lose him by my earth walk? If I lost him after he won me, then I'm doomed. And notice, that once you flip over to the other side, it's forever and ever and ever and ever. And there's nothing that can change it. That's what makes it serious business, beloved. I don't know if you understand what I'm talking about. I've sat down many times, long hours thinking. But Lord, why did you do it like this? Is there no other punishment? Why don't you just, okay, punish them. Let them stay in hell or lake of fire for a million years. And after that, they would have learned their lessons. But you know, it's, it's not like that in that realm. Because in that realm, time is not measured. Yes. Time is always now. So the punishment is for the now. It's an eternal now. There is no past, no future. I don't know if you understand that. And the concept of an eternal now is foreign to us right now because we are time beings. So I ask myself this question. That means I must take my walk with God and I must prioritize it above 
anything else because all else will pass away. And for eternity, this is the only thing that will stand. only thing that will stand. Not the test of time. But that will transcend time. So the Bible says there is a way to live our lives now as pilgrims and as what? Strangers. Teach me to number my days that I may apply my heart for wisdom. Selah. Hmm? Pause and think a while. We have a story of recent well, the situation recent back home. There was a, a, a wedding of two young people, a guy and a girl, you know, two weeks after the girl died. As a matter of fact, immediately after the wedding, before they even, I think it was after the reception, Immediately after the wedding, she took ill. No, she was ill, but she grew worse. They didn't even get home. She was straight from reception to the hospital. She never got home. And I saw the young man and uh, asked him a few questions. Yeah, they did some foolish things themselves, but hey, that's life. That's life. So the Bible says, don't make a boast of tomorrow. Right? Isn't that what the book of James says? Yeah. They say, by the grace of God. By the grace of God. Please read that again. Verse 8. And I look upon everything as lost. Notice, you see, when he says everything as lost, he's not saying that everything is lost. Right? But he's speaking in the context of the relationship of that gain to gaining Christ. So when you compare both, hey, this means nothing that's that's what he's, he's that that's what that means you know it means nothing to me it means nothing to me he says look i reckon it is dung that's the uh, king james right yeah yeah read it read on compared, compared as loss compared with the overwhelming gain Of knowing Christ Jesus, yes, my Lord. You remember we talked about Lordship yesterday? My Lord. Not our Lord, but my Lord. Who has another translation that puts it in a different way? Anybody, I, I don't know what message it say, but. Is what? Insignificant. That's a good way to say it. Put it, read it again. Hold on. All the things I thought were once so 
important are gone from my life. That means that there was a change of mindset. Compared to the high privilege. Everything I once thought I had going for me is insignificant. How many of us still think, how many of us think that way? Not too many. Some of us serve him to gain those things. Right? Yes. And then when we are gaining those things, we say, wow, serving Christ is worth it. Do you understand what I'm talking about? Oh, serving Christ is worth it. Why? Oh, he, he buttered my bread and That is downgrading the privilege of that relationship. If your satisfaction is dependent on those largest that you get, you've downgraded the relationship. It doesn't really mean much to you. Have you ever heard of people, you know, I know when I was in school, we had loads of people who would fail some vital electives, not electives, core courses, and then they would no longer serve God, just backslide, because they failed. Why did God allow me fail? Hey, guy, you didn't read. And it just backslide. Hey, bro, you're not coming to fellowship again. I was because I said, no, I spent too much time serving God. You know, I failed. You know, but, and he had nothing to do with serving God because really, if you look at it, how many hours do you spend serving God in a week? How many hours do you spend in fellowship? And even now in churches, for those who are involved in pastoring, now you're a pastor in Tony, so you know. Are there people who, who run into some tough situation or circumstance in their lives and they just stop coming to church. That's it. Church is no longer important. Why? Oh, pastor, let me sort myself out first. Okay. So now I know how important this relationship is with with Christ. Okay. Whereas the Bible says, trust the Lord with all your heart. In all your ways, acknowledge him. And he shall direct thy path. But that's not all. He said, and lean not to thine own understanding. So the understanding we need has to be spirit bread. So Job says there is a spirit in man. And the inspiration of the almighty give them understanding. It is the understanding that comes from the spirit that you and I need. And that understanding does not come as a gift. It has to be cultivated as you partner with the spirit. It comes through that development of a progressive inter, uh, 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 interaction with the Lord. A daily interaction. So the Bible says, this book of the Lord shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate on it day and night. As a consequence, the word opens. And the opening, the disclosure, is what King James simply referred to as the entrance. It's the opening of the word. Then gives light. And when that light comes, they say, wow, I see. Now I have understanding. That the eyes of your understanding be what? 
enlightened. That I may know the hope of his calling. The surpassing worth of knowing Christ is tied to the hope of his calling. I know the reason for this call. I know the reason. I know the reason. Most of us don't know the reason. So we think that serving God is for some earthly gain. Yesterday we talked about, I mean, it's just one life. One life. Right? Just one life. Praise God. Have you have you heard uh, the doctrine of eternal security? Yeah, it's growing uh -huh, in its influence. You know, you say yes, once saved, always saved. Um, it's a complete uh, distortion of the teaching of grace. Uh, it's complete distortion. It's not. It's not true. That once saved, always saved. No matter what you do, I should add that because actually, once saved, always saved. That's the way it should be. So the Bible says that you received him. Continue in him. You received him by faith. Continue in faith. Huh? But James says, be careful. For faith that has no works is dead. But faith that has works is the faith that Jesus Christ is looking for. And then why do I know that? Jesus kept saying, if you read through the scriptures, almost everywhere he spoke about his coming, he always says, Behold, I come quickly and my reward is with me. To render to every man according as his... Why doesn't that ever say according as my grace has given? But according as. And he always points it to the works. You read through the book of Revelation. Um, specifically chapters 2 and 3 where he was addressing uh, the church, the churches. And he would say, I know your works to every church. He seemed to be watching out for their works. Every church, seven of them he mentioned. I know your works. You, I know your works. Third, I know your works. To the fourth church, I know your works. To the fifth church, I know your works. To the sixth church, I know your works. To the seventh church, I know your works. And if you read through all of them, he gave a warning. If you don't change these works, these works will make you. I will come and judge this. I will remove the candle from this church. I will do this to this one. That was a judge speaking because the book of Revelation is not a book set on the platform of mercy. It's a revelation of the judgments of God. Right? That's what it is. The revelation of the judgments of God. Uh -huh. So God, God is, is giving the church expo. That is how it's going to be. So you guys, you better work hard. Hmm? On the basis of... So some, somebody will ask the question, is it... Is it therefore by works? Yes. Is by the works of faith. They are dead works. They are living works. Hmm? Mm -hmm. I don't know if you understand what I'm trying to help you see. Yeah, you don't. You don't. Okay, look at this. No matter how good you are as a person, you'll never make heaven. 
never, no matter how good you are, kind, gentle, you'll never make heaven. Because the Bible says that by the works of the flesh shall no man be justified. Right? Okay. So, only those who are justified have a clear path to heaven. So see the steps. You're justified, then sanctified, then glorified. Justified, sanctified, glorified. Are you following this? Now, I am not justified before the born again experience. It is at the process of justification that the new birth happens. Uh, or the time of justification, as it were, that the new birth happens. So, if before then, I had plenty good works, the Bible says that my, the best morality that man can produce is like filthy rags before God. Good master. And Jesus turned and said, there is no man good. There is no good man, Jesus said. Not even me. There is no good man. I'm not a good man. It's not by my goodness, if you understand what I mean by that. Jesus said, no man good but God. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But to walk the path of glory, first thing that must happen to the individual is that that person must be justified, i.e. must be made righteous. Right? All right. A man is made righteous when he hears the gospel message and truly believes it. And you see, in believing the gospel message, you know, again, we have changed the doctrines of Christ. You know, it, it, it takes me back to Hebrews 6. If you understand Hebrews 6, the very first two doctrines, which are, what's the first one? Repentance from dead works. What's the second one? Faith toward God. If you understand just those two, it answers that question. The doctrines are elementary doctrines of Christ. The first is what? Repentance from dead works. So let, let, me, let me ask you this question. Repentance, is it the same thing as confession? What's repentance? So the things I used to do, I do them no more. Right? So, if the Bible says this is the root of your walk with God, repentance from dead works. You know, yesterday we talked about that a bit. That means that, look, the past is kept queer, dead. The life to live now is, yeah, we may call it crucified life, but it's actually the resurrected life. Hmm? Mm-hmm. That's a new life. It's the life, the life, the resurrected life of Christ. Now, in living that life, first it says to repent from, turn around from dead works. Toward what? Faith. Toward God. What's faith? Faith is not a magic wand to receive things from God. No. Faith is a commitment to obey whatever God says. Faith is a commitment to move in the direction that God reveals. So if God says, hey, you were healed, hey, get up and walk healed. That's faith. You know, that's the only angle from which we talk about faith. We forget that the faith, we, there is a faith to live by. 
And the Bible says in Romans chapter 1, I am not, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God producing salvation in them that believe. So I receive his word with faith. Hmm? What happens? The gospel produces salvation in me. Now see what he then says in the next verse. He says, from faith to faith. From faith to faith. For therein is the righteousness of God. For in what is the righteousness of God? In the gospel. Righteousness of God. Right? So, I'm not ashamed of it. Go back please to 17. For I'm not ashamed of it. Huh? It says, for therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just, who is the just here now? The one who is justified. Now, what makes justification possible? Grace. Right? Before grace, it wasn't possible. So grace gave the platform upon which I can be made righteous. For the Bible says, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. What was the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ? The love of God. What was the love of God? <laughs> he gave his son. Right? For God so loved the world that he gave that whosoever does what? Believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And you know that righteousness and life go hand in hand. Sin and death go hand in hand. So I have life because I have been made righteous. I have eternal life because I have been made righteous in Christ. Before now, I had death because of sin. Now Jesus paid that price. He who knew no sin was made seen that I might be made the righteousness of God in Christ. So now I've been made the righteousness of God in Christ. Now, the making of an individual as the righteousness of God in Christ is what the Bible refers to as justification. Justification is the making right of a man. Making righteous. Hmm? Is that okay? All right. So, now I'm made righteous by faith. How should I live my life? By faith. So repentance of dead works unto faith toward God. And the Bible says in verse 17, from faith, because faith is what brought me here, to faith. What does faith do? What is faith? The Bible says in the book of Hebrews and 11, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Right? All right. You know, we've taken this a, a bit out of context, but let me help you see the context of this. Faith, substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Do you know that we're saved in hope? That every one of us who is born again is saved in hope? Huh? Now, and what we are saved to, we have not received right now. So the Bible says, Christ in us, the hope of glory. Remember what I started with? Justification, sanctification, and glorification. So now that I'm justified, I'm justified because I am in Christ. Christ won me. Christ found me. Right? So he justified me. So that he can glorify me. I'm justified. My hope is what? Glorification. There is a process from justification to glorification. What is that process called? Sanctification. So the Bible says, he who sanctifieth and they who are being sanctified are of one. That means that my entire earth walk should be one of what? Sanctification. Being set apart. I'm going to explain that now. 
since we've asked. Being set apart. Hmm? To sanctify something is to take something hmm, that is otherwise normal and dedicate it for the special service of God. The moment God takes this and says, from this moment forth, this belongs to me and I want it used for this purpose. If that thing is used for any other purpose, you've defiled it. Right? So if I am sanctified, right? I am sanctified hmm? or called by God and dedicated for his special purpose. If I, now look at this, for you and I as believers, we are a special breed because the Bible says that we're supposed to be a living sacrifice. Living. The sacrifices of all you kill them. This one, you are dead alive. <laughs> dead alive. Right? That is total dedication to God. That means that my members should not be used for anything that does not give glory to God. That means that my mind should not think of anything that does not give glory to God. Hence, Jesus redefined many things in the law and said, he who looks at a woman to lost, and a, man, a woman who looks at a man to lost. So you see, he's saying that even your mind, this is um, moved beyond the era of the acts, but just the thoughts. Thoughts, the intents of the heart, right? Okay, look at this. So for what, what we do not understand is that grace is tougher than than the law. Most of us don't know that. We just, oh, grace. We tend to have this feeling that grace is God now overlooks sin. It's not an overlooking of sin. We are empowered to live above sin by grace. That's what grace did. Grace gave us the ability to do what we could not do. But the grace that is being taught today is erroneous teaching. Championed. By many people. One of my Asian brothers, I listened to him some time back and he said, well, that he, he made up his mind to teach grace to the point where it will look like he is excusing sin. Because if you have not taught grace to the level where people think you are excusing sin, then you have not taught grace. I said, what? That's absolute rubbish. Absolute rubbish. I listened to him. He said, look, he, oh, he gave an example of, of Abraham. You know, that, uh, you know, for, for where sin abounds, grace abounds much more. So, if, if you want the grace of God to abound towards you, therefore, you know, if you sin, yeah, you, it's almost like sin creates an opportunity for grace to abound. I heard with my two ears, I saw him. It was video. It wasn't altered. Okay, let me give you his revelation. One, one of the revelations. Abraham went with his wife, Sarah. And then the king Abimelech desired Sarah. And Abimelech told her to tell a lie. Sorry, Ab Abraham told his wife to tell a lie. He said, tell her you're my sister. Of course, it was a half-sister anyway. So, but hey, say that. So that at least we can deceive them. Because if you don't, they probably will kill me and he will take you for wife. So he said, when, when they got there and Abimelech took Sarah, you know, Abraham was settled. He said they gave Abraham, Abimelech gave Abraham plenty, cattle, ram, and stock. Then God gave Abimelech a dream. Abimelech called Abraham. Abraham, why did you not tell me that this beautiful damsel is your wife? Do you know the God of heaven is vexed with me and I could have violated your wife? 
And he said, please, please, take your wife and go. You know what this man said? He said, Abraham went there alone with his wife. After he lied, he left that place with his wife and plenty sheep. That he was increased in goods. So, where sin? Grace abounded much more. What rubbish is that? And, and several others. I don't want to go into them because I don't think it's anything. Is, is, that, is that the teaching of the cross? Hey, the, the gifts and the callings of God are without repentance, they say. So you are the righteousness of God in Christ. You are the righteousness of God in Christ. It's a gift and God cannot change that. Okay. You are the son of God. It's a gift and it cannot be changed. And I said, okay, that's, that's, that's fair enough. But in Luke, the Bible tells me, Luke 3, 3. It says, and Adam, the son of God. How did Adam, the son of God, become the son of Satan? Was he not son of God? Wasn't it a gift? What happened to the corruption of that gift? If it was possible to corrupt the seed, that seed, then it is corrupt, it's possible to corrupt any seed. What about Judas? He had a part of this ministry. The Bible says his portion, let another take. Hey, grace, 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 grace is good. Paul said, be careful that you have received not the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ in vain. What does it mean to receive grace in vain? You receive the grace, the grace that's supposed to empower you to live a holy life. That grace now becomes an excuse for immorality. You have received the grace in vain because that grace will not produce glorification. It cannot, you have, you have, Crippled it. It cannot produce what it was intended for. Where did they get their teaching on grace from? I don't know. But certainly not from the Bible. This same Bible says. We used to use that a lot for crusade. When we go out. We are preaching to people. You know. We hold the crusade. And you know. Book of Hebrews. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? I will be talking to people and crying to unbelievers. Don't neglect the salvation of Christ. That, that was not for unbelievers. That message was for born again Christians. So to, to born again Christians, the writer of Hebrews, which I believe is the Apostle Paul, says, hey, if you neglect salvation, you won't do yourself. You neglect something that you are already aware of and you have received. And then Peter, Jude, warns the church. He says, look, if the word that began to be spoken by angels could receive this kind of recompense for those who did not obey it, how much more the word that began to be spoken by the Lord himself encased in human body. He was saying that the punishment for this will be worse by far than that. Did Jesus not say the same thing? Jesus said it will be better for those, for Sodom and Gomorrah. Because it was an angel that went there. But for you, I came here personally. Grace? We are in the age where people don't understand grace anymore. It's all by grace, not by works. Yeah. Not by works. But yet the Bible says that we are the workmanship of God created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Created unto 
works were designed. And you were custom made to fulfill that. That's grace. The new, cre the new creation is constant, was custom designed by God to carry out certain assignments. If we're not carrying out those assignments, we want a fulfilling purpose. And if you're not fulfilling purpose, yeah, you'll be discarded. In a house, there are many kinds of vessels. But then he teaches us how to make ourselves vessels of honor. He didn't say, I will make you. No, you determine whether you are a vessel of honor or not. I can go on and on and on, on with this. One. It's everywhere in the Bible. If I say, okay, let's, let me stretch myself and give you 10, 15, 20 verses of the Bible, I don't think I would blink to remember. Because it's everywhere. Second Peter 2, what did he say? He says, if, let, let's read it so you see with your two eyes, and then you can tell those who are teaching these erroneous doctrines that they should be careful. It's not by works, it's by faith. Faith is works. Yes. When I, that's why I say faith is works. Because it's, it's faith, faith that is alive and productive has works. When we say works, what, what do we mean by works? Works simply means corresponding action. So corresponding action. If we, if we decide, let us know it's not by works, it's by corresponding action. Right? By faith. The Bible says in Hebrews 11 that the elders of old obtained a good report. By faith. They obtained a good report. The things they believed for, they hoped for rather, they did not see in their lifetime. But yet they were reckoned to have walked by faith. They walked in hope. And the Bible says they lived by faith. Right? The Bible says Abraham believed for a country whose builder and maker was not God. Did Abraham see it? He never did. He, did he realize it in, on this earth? He never realized it on this earth. Yet, his walk was reckoned as a walk of faith. He's one of the heroes of faith. It's written there, clearly, in the book of Hebrews. It tells us that some of these people who walked by faith and had their hope established in that which God had promised. Some of them Refused deliverance in anticipation of a better resurrection. That's where their hope laid. So they hoped for glory. See what faith is the substance of things hoped for. Glory, the glorification of, of the church or the saint was the hope, the substance of that glory was the holy lives they led when they were here in this earth walk. So the man who knows that he has been separated unto glory will live a righteous and a holy life right now. That is the walk of faith. That is, the word substance is substantiating, building a foundation for that hope. It's all over scripture though. Quite candidly. Second Peter 2. 20. Who would read? What he's talking about, did they know God? Yes. Is he talking about born again people? Yes. Didn't they receive the grace? Yes. It says the latter end is worse. And people, the, the, 21. 
for it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness. Which means that these ones he's talking about knew the way of righteousness. Hmm? They were Christians. They were born again. Than having known it to turn from the what? Holy commandment delivered to them. The, the, the Bible not tell us that if you love me, you will. Why would he still be asking you to keep commandments? Who, is, who did he say that to? Those in the grace era or those in, under the law? Huh? You are in grace. He's still telling you keep the law. Sorry, keep uh, my commandment. If you love me, you will do what I say to do. If you love me, you will do it. If you love me, you will obey my word. How, why do you call me Lord? If you will not do what I say to do. If you don't do what I say to do, but you confess me as Lord, you worship me as Lord, you sing of me as your Lord, you tell everybody I'm your Lord, but in practical terms, you are not doing what I say to do. You are a liar. He actually says that you are a worker of iniquity. He didn't say you are a believer of iniquity. You believe in righteousness, but you walk in iniquity. He didn't judge what they believed. Talk to me. What did he judge? What they lived. So what has happened today? Everybody is careless and carefree. Whereas the Bible says that this sojourning for us as believers, it says you are to carry it out in fear. Fear. Work out your salvation. He said, no, can't do no work. It is the language of the Bible. I'm not the one who originated it. He said, work out your salvation. How? You say, well, that's Paul. Paul did not understand. Okay, let's see what Peter said. First Peter chapter 1. First Peter 1. Let me see if that's, if that's what I really want. First Peter 1. Are we there? Help me so we can read it. Read Who will read? From verse uh, 13. Therefore, be what? Sober. You know what it means to be sober? What does it mean? To think. Thank you. Let your thoughts not be beclouded by erroneous teachings, false doctrines. Let your estimate be proper. Think not of yourself more highly than you ought, but think how? Soberly. That, so to think soberly means to think correctly. Think accurately. Accurately as determined not by what you want to hear, but by what the word reveals. So it says, therefore, get up your loins of your mind, read on, be sober. Uh -huh. Wait, no, 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 wait, wait, wait. Hope for grace. Mm -hmm. But we are in grace. We have grace already to do whatever we like. <laughs> 
and live any kind of life we want to live. Huh? It says, and hope to the end for the grace. That's the original NIV or New King James. New King James. Okay, go on. Wait, wait, wait. When will the grace be brought? At the revelation. When is the revelation of Jesus Christ? It's the second coming. The apocalypse. <laughs> and that is when the church enters into its inheritance. The inheritance of the church is not health, wealth. <laughs> That's not the inheritance of the church. Those are fringe benefits. Fringe. The Bible says that we are born again unto a lively hope. The, the purpose of our salvation, the, the, the inheritance that, that we're saved to possess, we cannot enter into it in this life. As a matter of fact, the glory that is to be revealed, if God were to decide that, okay, enter into that glory, your body, your physical body will, will disintegrate. Because it is not built to carry the eternal weight of glory. This is mortal. That's why he says when he, at his revelation, he says that the vile will be made glorious like his own body. Until that happens, you don't have the capacity to carry the glory that you are safe to carry. In the interim, I'm in Christ, in hope of glory. So, which means that I, I ought to be living my life saying that there's nothing that will cheat me out of that glory. It's my own. It is my portion in Christ. I am an heir. Hmm? I don't know if you understand what I'm talking about. Read on, please. As, notice how he referred to us. Because when, once you get born again, you are by grace made obedient. So you notice that God does not speak of believers as rebellious children. But he always speaks of believers as obedient children. Why? His grace has custom designed and fashioned you to obey. So there is no born again Christian, no truly born again Christian lacks the capacity to do what God says to do. There is no true born again Christian. Who can say. Justifiably that the devil made me do something else. The devil does not have the capacity to make you do. What you ought not. Whatever you do. Is a matter of your choice. Strong temptation yes. But you could have said no. You didn't. If the unbeliever said the devil made me do it, that's understandable. They are in his camp. There is a spirit that works in the children of disobedience. I'm not a child of disobedience. You as a, as a Christian, you're not a child of disobedience. You are a child of obedience. And so God never refers to you as a disobedient child. No. So when you disobey, he's disappointed. Because you are acting contrary to your nature. That's not who you are now. That's what you were. Why are you still living in your past? That's not who you are now. I mean, a Christian runs to God and says, God, the devil is pursuing me. The devil is pursuing me. The devil pursue you. Okay. Will you not do something? Me. Do something. Even God will do like that to you. <laughs> I'll be looking at you. Lord, you are looking. The hey, devil is even beating me now. And you are here, you are looking at him beating me. You say he? No God speaks to me. Hear me. <laughs> See my, my son. <laughs> the Bible says, and these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name, they shall cast out devils. It's, it's not, it didn't say for the mature. 
The moment you get born again, you have authority over devils. These are, for crying out loud, the church is no longer being taught the truth. When the, I mean, the ministers want all, all the praise and glory to come to them. Come to me and I will pray for you. And the devil will take his hands off your life. Come to me, I will pray for you. And you will enter into prosperity. Come to me and I will pray for you. And you will receive rubbish. I should be telling you, you are a child of God. Rise up and take charge of your life. That's who you are. There is no weakling born into the new creation. Wake up. Take your stand. James says, my friend, will you stand tall? Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Hey, who, did that, was that command ever given to an unbeliever? He can try it. He doesn't have the capacity for it. But the Christian, the born again Christian, the new creation, don't tell me you don't know what the grace of God has done for you. Some people don't like me because I preached like this. That's your headache. Say, Pastor Oje is spoiling our business. No, I'm talking about ministers now. I'm hated in the corridors of power. <laughs> oh, you say, oh, no, that man. We have to arrange for him one of these days. I've heard many things. How can you just be telling them like that? There is no preacher who is a high priest. The high priest is the mediator, and there's only one mediator between God and man. Come to me as if I'm Manu Tumopo Esparti. Come to me. I want to get married. Okay, that's good. Uh, Pastor, please look into her eyes and tell me if she's right for me, me to look into her eyes. What you didn't see, you want me to see? I can't see. <laughs> hmm? This is a, this is this is his picture, Pastor. His picture. What do you want me to do? I should cast a spell on this picture. I should declare. <laughs> I hear. We go and buy four candles. We bring anointing oil. We have made the Goya company very rich. <laughs> Business strategy. They will even help the pastors to they will give them revelation. <laughs> Whereas the Bible says that even if you empty a river of oil, forget it. It's not going to make a difference between your relationship and mine. It's there in the Bible. Strange teachings. I know we are, we are propagating it everywhere now. It's global now. <laughs> A shot of the oil. You drink it. And anoint your tongue. Yeah. Anything you say shall come to pass. It's not... <laughs> Is it... <laughs> Erupt quick. I have walked on this. Use it and you will prosper. The man says, Okay, see my secretary. <laughs> then you go to secretary, say, um, You have to pay 10,000 for this, you have to pay this for this. It's trade. We're in the age where we need to take the cane and the whip and go after those money changers. Let them know that the house of God should not be a den of thieves. What took us here? 
as obedient children. Thank you. You have a problem. Okay. Have you gone to God? You say, well, pastor, um, not really. I decided to come and see you. Good. So it is my duty to educate you on what to do. You have a high priest who is touched by the feelings of your infirmities. Because of his work in your life, you have received the gift of righteousness. It's not just a gift now. You have been made righteous. The Bible says because you are made righteous in the righteousness of God, come boldly to the throne of grace and find grace to help in a time of need. Go to God. Okay, Pastor, I've heard. Is that all? Yes. Okay, please pray for me first before I leave. <laughs> I can't just walk away like that. You know what I mean? Pray for me first. All right, let's pray. Mm, you had a dream. Um, in the dream, Divination has started. If you don't do that, people don't believe. Come, say, come to church. Say, which church? Yeah, the pastor, they see. No, not they see. The eyes of his understanding are enlightened. There's only one direction in which he sees. Do you understand where I'm going? Yeah. The believer is not a weakling. Do we know who we are in Christ? I can't make it. Shut up. God will say to you, except I'm not the one who designed you. Are you born again? Yes, Lord. Did I not say that the power that is resident inside you is bigger by far and can produce beyond your highest thoughts and imaginations? Did I not say that there is a power resident inside you that can work things and bring things to pass beyond what you would even dare to ask? Yes, Lord, you said that. Have you asked? No, Lord. Why haven't you? I'm not a pastor. Hmm? All right. We'll wait for you to become one. Then you can ask. If you understand what I'm saying. It's a gift for every child. For every child. I was asked a question by ministers of recent in the ministers' conference I was talking about. Hey, pastor, what about generational, no, 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 uh, firstborn, whatever. I said, that, that is a lie from the pit of hell. Special services conducted to deliver firstborns. Firstborns. So when Jesus went to the cross, his deliverance did not cover firstborns. He started from secondborn. <laughs> and left firstborn for pastors to deliver or prophets to deliver. Or apostles to deliver. I cannot understand it. As obedient children, yes, not fashioning, not fashioning, which means that every child of God is equipped to live a different life, a new life, not his former life. Read on. Uh, wait, wait, wait. As obedient children, be holy. That's what he's saying. Don't follow the lusts of the former life. We already saw those who follow the lusts of the normal life, of the former life. He says when they get entangled, they're in and overcome. And it is better than they never knew the Lord. Than haven't known him to turn your back on him. I should fear God though. Isn't that what the Bible says? 
Yeah, some of us say, no, don't fear God. You know, the fear of God is our actually love for God. Good. The same apostle Paul who gave revelation said, knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. If you don't have a revelation of the terror of God, then you can treat God like a goody goody and uh, like Santa Claus. He's no Santa Claus. The Bible says, knowing the mercy and the severity of God. Fear him. Jesus even encouraged us to fear him. He said, fear him. Don't fear, don't fear man who can kill your body. Fear the one who can both kill your body and your soul in hell. Fear him. Jesus said, Jesus said, fear God. Fear. Everybody, speak. say it. Fear God. Phobos and troubles. Hmm? Fear. And trembling. Walk out your salvation. I didn't write it. Anybody who wants to read it, read it. If it doesn't say that, don't believe it. Right? When we stand before God, then you will tell him. I thought. Uh -huh. Then you say, okay. Let's see. That, that, was, that was Paul. This is Peter. Hmm? Read on, please. That's verse 15, right? Okay. In what? All manner of conversation, yes? Is holiness demanded of the of the new creation? Yes, it is. Obey. One minister said we're not as new creatures are not supposed to obey God. Yeah. So we're not supposed to obey. Obedience is for people under the law. Say so why? What are we supposed to do? Just live the life. Enjoy, have fun. You are a new creature. You have arrived already. There is nothing to strive for. Then Paul must have been a fool. Who after being separated for three years and Jesus personally taught him the gospel. The same Paul was the one who was the saying that I, I, I keep my body under subjection. So that after preaching the gospel, I myself will not become a castaway. That means Paul did not have faith. The same Paul was the one who said, look, I do not reckon myself to have apprehended. I am pressing on and praying to apprehend that for which I was apprehended. That I might attain. The word attain, it's to earn. Go and check the Greek. Before somebody will come and say, well, in the Greek... The Greek says to attain is to work for, to earn the resurrection from the dead. It's been given you. Yes. Defend it. Didn't the Bible say in Galatians 5, stand fast, right? And that's the way we put it in the liberty where we Christ has made you free. Which means that there are many who have been made free in Christ but are not standing fast. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to do what? Stand. I don't need to put it on. Grace has put it on already. Yeah, grace has it on. If you do not walk by grace, you won't have it on. Anything that has to do with an effort from our side, they say, no, that's not grace. That is legalism. Legalism. The same Peter, Second Peter said, hold, we're going to continue with this. I, I'm not too sure we've reached where I want us to get to. The same Second Peter 1, from which that book, Seven Pillars, was written. What, what did Paul say? He says, look, to your faith, add. My faith is enough. Mm-hmm. Thank you. The Bible says if you must have a rich entrance into heaven, if you must be fruitful, 
and productive in your knowledge of Christ Jesus to your faith. Add. And not just add casually. He says, diligently. Add. Add to my faith. Add. Why would that be required of me? Do you have a copy of the book? Let me read something out from it. The price for his ultimate. Hmm? God has given all we need. He's given, he has given all we need. There's nothing left for him to give. Huh? That's why he says he has given us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. Now, it is up to us to give our best if we must attain full stature in the divine life. Perfection in the divine life is the ultimate purpose of God. The new birth is the necessary first step in the process. Casual Christians cannot give their all, for they cannot afford it. The price, uh, the price to pay is too high for them. This is for casual Christians. They have too much at stake in the world to give their all. It takes a believer who understands that Christianity is not a part of his life. I guess we talked about this yesterday. But all of it. To do his utmost to attain God's ultimate purpose. To enjoy the full provisions of the cross of Christ. We must be prepared to pay the price necessary. I'm skipping some things. A close look at this passage, that's the passage I just read, where he says, given all diligence. A close look at this passage uh, that we are, uh, reveals that we are important players in the process of change and spiritual development in our lives. It says, and besides this, making reference to the divine promises and provisions mentioned in verses 3 and 4, acknowledging God's grace and salvation, Recognize we have a responsibility to stay free from the lust of the flesh and participate in the divine life. It is the staying free from the lust of the flesh. That's what we just read. It says not fashioning yourself after the former lust. Okay. He says giving all diligence uh, is a direct instruction to the believer. The indication is that besides the promises and provisions of God, the believer has a part to play in this process of transforming his life into the image of Christ. Giving is translated from the Greek word, whatever it is there, which literally means to bear in alongside or to introduce simultaneously. And diligence is translated from the Greek word spude, which stands for speed, dispatch, eagerness, and earnestness. The word defines the opposite of, uh, this word defines the opposite of apathy. It speaks of zeal, fervor, enthusiasm, industry, and seriousness. The believer is required by the word of God to press toward attaining the ultimate purpose of a transformed life meticulously. We cannot experience the fullness of God casually. Casual is a violation of the Christian's spiritual code of conduct. God rewards, as Hebrews 11.6 states, those who seek him diligently. The casual go away empty-handed. In, in Romans 12 and verse 11, we are admonished to serve the Lord with favor and not slothfulness. Once we get born again and become followers of Christ, we are to painstakingly pursue the development of these seven virtues mentioned in 2 Peter chapter 1. We get the command to add to our faith wrong. When we think of an arithmetic computation, the word add um, in the Greek is the word um, epikorigio or whatever. It connotes something else. And that is to fully furnish Provide or supply your faith with the virtues that make it attain its goal. Without going into the historical origin of this word, its meaning in the context of our study is to be extremely generous, to supply lavishly all that is required to make your faith alive and fruitful. 
that is for us to do. Is you have faith. Now he's saying, make your faith alive. Make it fruitful. And do it with speed. Do it with all earnestness. Huh? God gave lavishly. We are to respond lavishly. In sparing no effort to live the life that pleases God. Pledge your energies to grow in grace. You know the Bible says for us to grow in grace. You read that too in Peter. Give your all to bear the fruit of righteousness and confirm your faith. The believer must make every effort to actively pursue these virtues. Supplying your faith with these qualities is another way of saying to believe without these moral consequences is fruitless living. And went on and on and on and on and on and said a lot. You know, an example is given here on the life of uh, uh, Lot when Jesus said to them, remember Lot's wife. Lot's wife died in the path of salvation. It was in the path of salvation that she was judged. She was already saved. Walking the path of salvation just to get to the place, the appointed destination. She disobeyed. Jesus said, remember Lot's wife. Why did he say that? What about Israel? They, they were already saved. They had already passed through the baptism in the Red Sea. They were in the wilderness, journeying to the land of glory. Just like we are journeying to our land of glory. It was in the place of temptation, in the wilderness, where they, where they had trials. That's where they perished. They perished in the path of salvation. So nobody should tell me that in our age that people cannot perish in the path of salvation. Many are. And that's why we need to be careful. Amen. But there is not one of us who lacks what it takes to make it right. Not one. Has given us all things all that pertain unto life and godliness. So I don't like it. Please read on. Um, verse 17. And if ye call on the Father, who without respect of persons judgeth according to every man's work. Mm -hmm. Was Paul talking to those under the law? Or to the new creation? I mean, was Peter talking to those under the law or to the new creation? New creation. What was he telling them? That the God of the new creation is also a judge. Mm -hmm. Judge of works. <laughs> I like that. Judge of works. The God of the new creation. Read that verse again, please. And if ye call on the Father, who without respect of persons judgeth according to every man's work. Pass the time of your sojourning here in fear. Mm. Pass the time of your sojourning, sojourning here, in, here in, fear. in fear. He's admonishing the church. Don't take God for granted. Don't take the grace of God for granted. Did the Bible not say in the book of Hebrews that, that warning us that we should we should be careful? How did he put it again to admonish one another so that an evil heart of unbelief will not spring up? Uh huh. Thank you. Read it. Hebrews three twelve. <clears throat> Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God, but exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin, for we are made partakers of Christ, if we hold uh, the beginning of our confidence steadfast, steadfast unto the end. We are made partakers of Christ if. If is a word. Thank you. Who was he talking to? Christians. Hello, believers. We are made partakers if 
we hold on to the end. Not if you begin. If you hold on to the end. What did the Bible say? It says, he that endureth to the end. Same shall be saved. Keep keeping on. Never give up. Keep walking with the Lord. Hey, I'm a Christian, yes. Keep at it. Is there anything to fear? No. Just fear God. And do what he says to do. And keep at it. If you fall, say like David, I'll pick myself up if I fall seven times and continue the journey. Say, I fell. Pick yourself up immediately. Don't die out of self-pity. Correct your ways. Repent. Move on. That's why the Bible says, if any man sin, we have an advocate. So all the provisions to make us succeed is there. But the possibility of falling away is also there. That possibility is what the erroneous teaching of grace has taken away. And if I think that there is no possibility, then I will live a righteous life and just do anything I want to do. You say, well, um, I'll make it just that I will not have some crowns. The one crown that you may not have is called the crown of life. And if you lack that crown of life, Praise God.